Welcome to Crazy Beats Big. I'm Kevin Romeo. I'm your host. And today we are talking with Stanley Steps. What's up, Stanley? What's up? How are you doing? Good. Uh, so this is actually kind of really cool because I don't know you very well. I just kind of follow you on social media. And when I first... I'm so sorry. <laughs> when I first stumbled across your stuff, it was maybe, I think about a year ago and you were doing some stuff with Amir. Yeah, maybe. KDPS. Yep. And uh, I thought what you were doing was really interesting, but I wanted to just kind of give people some context for what you do. So you could do that probably way better than me. So why don't you tell us like your story and just who you are, what you do, give us a quick thing and then we'll maybe dig in deeper. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I consider myself a, a creative, um, entrepreneurship has been in my blood. Um, I had made an entry into financial services back when I was 16 and, and that was really just a job at that time. Um, at 19, I got serious about it. I had two, uh, financial advisors that I worked for had offered me a position to come on board with their team. And I initially told them, no, uh, my passion, and I learned this at an early age, I knew that I wanted to uh, inspire, motivate, empower, and educate individuals in some form or capacity. And so in the financial space, I just saw that as another opportunity to really help to empower and equip people to ultimately pursue their dreams. You know, if you've got your money together, you're, you, know, you can take a little bit more risk and really, you know, launch out there and, and do some things. So, you know, I was in that world for from 16 to I'll uh, be 35 this year. So about three years ago, I had made an exit from that business to go full time creative, which, you know, there were a lot of um, things that I, I had ventured into along with being a financial advisor, but it just wasn't possible. You know, I just realized at a point that I need to go full time into being a creative and making it work. So, um, yeah, that's that's been my my world. I don't consider myself a financial guy. I've always been an, an entrepreneur, but that was just a space that I was in until you know something else came along. Um, you know, before we got started, we were talking about my children's music album. Um, Which you were the producer of. I was the producer yeah. of. And yeah, so I, I actually, um, in 2012, I wrote a children's book. And the children's book featured uh, me and my son. It's entitled Christian and Daddy Go Shopping. Because um, in, in going back before that, working as a financial advisor, it was just boring. Like I, I love helping clients, you know, moving them forward, but it just wasn't enough for me. And, you know, as a creative, it's you've always got to stir the pot and figure oh, yeah. out there's something else I need to be doing. Yep. Um, and so I was going to say, and with numbers, I can imagine that the, um, there's a limit, maybe this was true for you, maybe not, but with financial and numbers, it just seems like there's always a finiteness to the, the problems you're solving, right? Where with the creative, you like the idea of that there's a lot of possible outcomes that you can get to. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it, and it was, I mean, because, you know, working in the industry, I was the youngest, um, you know, here in Kalamazoo, born and raised. The youngest person in the room, the only African American in the room, um, and so it was tough, especially for clients potentially to take me serious. And so I had to get a little bit creative on how do I approach people, and that's where I had the idea to do a financial education company. So I was like, okay, a lot of people in my community that you know would have some appeal to work with me didn't really have the assets for me to build a nice size book of business to fully sustain myself. I mean, I had some really great clients along the way. And so my financial education company I started in 2011 was really aimed at, you know, in a creative way to educate people about finances, budgeting, you know, retirement planning, and hopefully prepare them to potentially become a client. Um, I had a really big break where communities and schools of Kalamazoo had booked me to uh, provide financial education for about six elementary schools. Really fun, enjoyable experience. I loved it going out to, again, inspire, motivate, educate, and empower individuals. But... Um, I was tired. My wife is a, was a Kalamazoo public school teacher. And I was like, I don't know how she does it every day. You know, I'm doing this six week classes, traveling all around, you know, to these, um, these sites to teach, but I was tired. And you know, I, I went home, uh, after a few weeks and it just hit me. I was like, I want to create something that I can um, almost duplicate myself. And yeah. I got the idea to write a children's book. So that's when 2012, I published Christian Daddy Go Shopping. And I wasn't, I wasn't satisfied. There was always, okay, I've got to figure out what's the next thing I can do to help inspire and educate uh, young people. That's when I had the idea for the music album. So then I produced the album uh, the following year and I still wasn't satisfied. I was like, okay, video. Man, kids love video. I want to educate, but I don't want to do a, a standard, you know, boring type of show. I want to do something that's really engaging. And uh, just the idea hit me um, to produce a show hosted by kids. And it's called um, Money Smart Kids TV. 
Didn't know what I was doing. So I talked about buying all this film equipment. Had absolutely no idea what I was doing, but I went on YouTube, watched several videos about the type of equipment that you want to purchase. Bought a, a, a 7D, um, an iMac. I mean, I spent about 13 grand on video equipment. I had no idea what I was doing. But we ended up producing a show. Yeah, had TJ Duckett in it. Oh, uh, nice. No good friend of mine here from Kalamazoo. You uh, know TJ Duckett? Running back. Yeah, that's, that's, cool. that's my best. Best buddy. Really? Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you my story about him. I don't have a big story. I'll tell you later, though. Okay. You want me to tell you now? Yeah. There's not much to it. Basically, when I was in high school, I grew up in a kind of farm town uh, west of here a little bit, but I was a pretty good uh, shot put and discus thrower Okay. for a small town. And then I was like looking at the numbers when it was preseason or whatever, and I'm like, who the crap is this TJ Duckett guy? Like, this guy's an animal, and he's... you know, not only was he throwing shot put like 60 feet or whatever he mm-hmm. was, 65 feet, just unreal numbers, but he also ran the 200 in like 20 seconds flat, basically. And I'm like, I was like to my coach, like, this is not fair. Who is this guy? And he's like, dude, that guy's going to go to the NFL someday. So don't worry about him. You just uh, don't don't get over concerned with the guys from the big schools because you're just a little farm town kid. But uh, so I've always kept up with TJ and I actually got the chance to meet him. A long time later when we were both on like this little panel that was uh i don't remember what it was it was some thing put on by um maybe the chamber or something like mm-hmm. that some motivational thing or whatever it's pretty cool but now he's not at all intimidating he's a very cool casual TJ guy is, like, i mean he, he's just a wonderful soul and so we reconnected because tj had retired from the nfl uh 2011 2012 and just went on this journey that ultimately he created a nonprofit all about giving back, giving yep. back um, service to the world to make it a better place um, called New World Flood. And so the whole concept was, you know, a single raindrop can be the begin- beginning of a flood. And we grew up together, you know, at church here in Kalamazoo. Really didn't connect, weren't very tight because he was about a year older than me. and was off in Michigan State than the NFL. But when I came up with my children's book and I was doing a lot of social media and posting about that, like, oh man, dude, I love what you're doing. And he invited me to Lansing, his, where he's living now, uh, to present at a um, community center. And so we reconnected in 2012 and just have been you know, buddy, buddy ever since. Um, so, so yeah, so I had had this concept of doing this TV show where kids were the host. Um, Harold Ziegler let me use their conference room to host. I had two teenagers present. And so the, the idea was to introduce financial literacy entrepreneurship and career readiness through these interviews of young people. And they were our kid correspondents. So I had a, a nine year old, a, a friend of mine, I called up um, a friend of mine from, from here in town to travel with me to Cleveland. And on the way to Cleveland, I got on the phone and I was like, okay, let me give um, the Cleveland Indians a call. Why not? Called the main line. <laughs> and uh, so this you know, young lady picks up and I say, hi, my name is Stanley Steps. I'm the producer of Money Smart Kids TV. <laughs> and, and then I knew this. I knew not to ask for an athlete. They were going to say no immediately. But I, I, I spinned it around. I said, I have a nine-year-old that I like to have interview someone in your front office to learn about what it's like to work for a sports team. And they set us up. And I'm on the field. I brought my crew um, my best friend and his son, and he was able to sit down you know, with the hiring manager of the entire Indians organization. Wow. Um, so we produced about a 45-minute episode of Money Smart Kids TV, all these different great interviews, all these kids, and it went nowhere because uh, uh, I didn't have an audience for it. You know? yeah. So that's, that's where, where I'm at today, and I feel like, I, yes, I've had some levels of success and some really you know, high-profile things to a degree. But at the same time, I had this frustration. I was like, man, I've done this, I've done that, I've done that. But I really couldn't get my wheel spinning. And maybe we'll, we'll get to that. But, yeah. but I've, I've done a lot. I've done some you know, pretty cool things. But yeah. now, right now, I'm at a place I'm taking it one day at a time. This is where I'm actually not a very good interviewer because I, my brain goes all over the place and I don't stick to any specific point. I just want to ask you about like 10 different things. I think the thing that really stuck out to me in that little part you're saying, a couple of things, um, I think you have a why that's pretty clear, inspire, educate, and empower oh, your why drives you in everything you do, mm-hmm. whether it's financial or creating media or whatever, whatever. Uh, and I think that's one of the biggest things that a lot of people that don't understand what it takes to get into entrepreneurship and find success is that you can take that and do anything you want with it within the realm of your skill set, or exactly. if you can pull people in, that's why you can produce an album or write a book or do media content or get a show on a network or whatever. And uh, the other thing I think was really cool 
that if, if someone's watching this and that, that I would say, look, look at what this guy just did. You being unafraid to just make a call, it might seem a little audacious, but not being a lot of people let the fear of looking kind of dumb, stop them from making that call. Exactly. They're like, I don't care if I feel stupid on this phone call. I'm going to call the Cleveland Indians and ask them if I can do an interview. And you made a good play on it. Really smart play. So I have a nine year old on interview. It's like, who's going to turn you down? You know, maybe they would, but that's very, very smart. So, <clears throat> um, so that's kind of like your kind of backstory. Um, I didn't know you're in a financial, I didn't know you're in the financial world. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and how did you get into that or what was your, well, so I, when I was 16, I had, um, I was a junior at Kalamazoo Central and a local financial advisor was, you know, a friend and, uh, of the teacher. And so she had invited him to come, you know, do a, just to talk to the kids about, you know, his career. And I wasn't even there that day. Um, so the next day when I showed up at school, she said, Hey, Stanley, this financial advisor came in, he's looking for a student worker. And I think you'll be a great fit for it. Um, and it, it just speaks to like, I've always been, you know, I started my first business when I was nine years old. Um, entrepreneurship was kind of dormant in me. Um, after that experience. And it it sounds really sad. So I started this business at nine. It was a little pencil business. I was buying pencils from my school store. And, you know, we had a pretty large church at the time. And I knew that parents, see, and that goes back to that little savvy. I knew my friends didn't have money. I was like, these parents are going to eat this up. (laughs) And uh, so I marked up the price, got my little order forms and, you know, started, you know, selling uh, to people after church. Ended up hiring two of my friends and I took my little shoebox of stuff back to uh, Chicago. We were visiting some family there and I left everything on top of the car and it was gone. <laughs> when I came back, I was like two hours later, everything was gone and I never picked the business back up you again. You probably cried a lot about it. Well, I just laughed. You know what? Like now I'm harboring feelings, but back then it wasn't a big deal because as a kid, I was like, oh, okay, no big deal. I'm going to move on to something else. But I look okay. back like, man, I could have been a pencil mogul ah. you know, by this point of my parents that, you know, help cultivate that in you me. You can still be a pencil mogul. So, so but you know, that experience of, of not having that uh, support to the degree that now when I look back, I wish I would have had from my parents. That's what motivated me with the money smart kids brand was, okay, this could be something for young people to not only inspire them, but also equip them to, to move on. Uh, whether they become an entrepreneur or not, there's certain things that, you know, and you know, the success, the, the, failures and all the stuff in between just helps prepare you for that next thing. Um, so yeah, so that was, uh, that was, that was a pretty, pretty cool experience, but the, but the financial piece, but, and again, it was just a job for me, but I showed some commitment and dedication. And so when I was 19 years old, you know, they saw something in me and was like, Hey, we want you to join our team, join our firm. And I, I told them no, but I went back to, okay, what is my life purpose? I'm here to inspire, to motivate, empower, and educate. Did you know that at 19? At 19. When did you figure that out? Um, it really is about... Um, How did you figure that out? Well... That's what everyone out there doesn't know. What am I going to do in my life? And then yeah. you're at 19. I don't want to take that financial job because I'm here to... How well, did you know? Well, the reason why I told them no, I was actually um, working with a board game. So in my junior year, I had a marketing course. And in my marketing class, it, something just came alive in me. Uh, my teacher wasn't very exciting. It was just the topic of marketing was like, oh man, this is something different. And it started to wake that thing in me that was dormant at nine back up. And so I'd ask my teacher, I said, can I take my, <laughs> this is not normal. I was like, can I take my marketing book home for the summer? So I uh-huh. took my marketing book home and I just kept going through it, these nine principles of marketing. And I was like, okay, I want to make something that's going to make this come alive for other people. And it just hit me. I turned off the TV the whole summer and decided to create a uh, board game. So I made a board game that taught players about the nine functions of marketing as, so you're an entrepreneur, you take on that character. In my senior year, that same teacher said, hey, you know, I think you can compete in DECA with this. So you can take my class again and do, uh, what is it, work study where you don't, basically you don't have to do the classwork. I can yeah. work on my own project. And uh, so I focused on that my whole senior year. Um, and that's where entrepreneurship, I was like, okay. It, and in many ways, entrepreneurship ruined me. It's made me, but it also ruined me in that oh, yeah. um, I had a full ride to go to Western Michigan University, and I was shook up with this, okay, I'm going to have that Bill Gates story. Like, I don't need college. Mm-hmm. And so my first year at Western, I just was not focused. I, w- I was focused on many of the right things, but my college education I was at the bottom of the list. Yeah. And so, you know, people that have known me, I was a suit and tie guy. Really? The beard is new. Um <laughs> 
you know, I was just very clean cut, very focused. And so over the years, you know, everyone's thought like, okay, Stanley has a degree. And because I, I can sit in a room with anyone, I can have a conversation with anyone. And, you know, I'm, uh, over the years, I've, I've managed millions of dollars and all of that. But making the shift to creative is still new for a lot of people. Like, yeah. you're here with a camera? What are you doing? Huh. Um, but it's, it's really, I feel like at this point, uh, I've, I know who I, I need to be. Um, and, and one of the things I wanted to talk about, too, is and I pulled, posted this recently. It's been about a year now where, you know, I've shared that I've given up on my dreams. That's what I was going to ask you about, yeah. if that was what that was about. So yeah. talk. Yeah. You just so, had, you just did my question. Go ahead. So, no, I've always been. A I'm very, not going to talk today. No, you're, you're just good. Gonna, you're just going to talk. <laughs> this is great. No, I've, I've always I'm been a, a really big dreamer over the years. I mean, like changing the world type stuff. But at the same time, you know, pursuing changing the world, you forget about just the simple, basic things that need to be done to take care of. Um, you know, and being a father, I have a 10 year old. Uh, we have a seven year old. Uh, I've been married uh, in April. It'll be 12 years. And so you realize you take a lot of risk. Congrats. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. For all that stuff you just said. Thanks. And, and, you know, I've taken a lot of risk over the years as an entrepreneur. Um, and I look back, I was like, man, I missed. I wasn't always present with my family, with my friends, with, you know, people around me because I've been so focused on this here and reaching this goal. Um, and I've had these knocks, knocks over the head. And so, you know, from the outside, a lot of people see great success. And, and I have, you know, I acknowledge that. I've done some really cool things, but I was always hung up on like, okay, this looks good, but man, you guys don't know the the true story. And it's not that yeah. I was trying to hide or cover up anything. It's just- You got a beautiful I think, I think family, the way, by the way. Thank you. picture you just posted, I was like, man, you're yeah. right. It's easy to go, that guy's got everything you'd ever want. Great yeah. wife, great kids, great life, awesome job. Like, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's just tough. You know, the journey of an entrepreneur has been really tough and- especially when you're so focused on next year and, and five years from now and 10 years from now, or, or feeling like this should have happened now yep. where I decide, and, and it sounds really negative giving up on your dreams. Like how do you tell a kid to give up on their dreams? But I feel like I, I should focus on what's right in front of you now and let those opportunities that come to you, you know, so basically, you know, if you have those, the core principle of your life, you know what you're supposed to be doing when opportunities come to you, you can make a quick decision like, okay, this fits and this doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. what I did over the years was trying to make things happen instead of, I don't want to say going with the flow because that sounds like you're just kind of going with the wind. Yeah. But, but being real with yourself saying, okay, this is something you need to work on and cultivate <laughs> now and see what it develops into. Um, so, you know, my journey of film like, you know, Can I hire the, you to come in and speak no, <laughs> to everyone at Ryan? <laughs> no, so it's, it's just really tough. It's They'll like, just watch the podcast. You know, I could have been... A freaking amazing financial advisor. Yeah, you'd probably if I have a lot on, of money on being an advisor. Yeah, um, and and I was always looking at the next thing instead of like, hey, you can be a great advisor. Get your stuff together. Make sure you've got that positive cash flow coming in, and then go do the next thing. So yeah. you know, I say all that. I'm in a really good place now, and I've had those failures, and and you know, I would say too, fail forward, and. And that's what I love about my resilience um, and even my family is I, I have been able to fail forward, but I wish I had focused a little bit more on what was in front of me years ago. And I say all that, you know, I'm about to be 35, but man, at, at 25, I, you're pretty young in the scheme of things. I, I'm, I'm 34 as well. And uh, sometimes I feel like I'm getting pretty old, but when you think about people who have quote unquote made it or people you look up to most of the time, they're 50, you know, right. they're there. I mean, unless, unless you're talking about music or like really artistic athletic careers. Yeah. They peak at 28 or whatever, mm -hmm. 30, but <clears throat> anyone who's continuing to grow and learn and develop in their career, you really hit a stride at like 40, 50, even 60, well into your sixties, you can be creating awesome stuff, yeah. but, you know, but here's my problem. So yeah. my problem was I didn't want that story for me. I, wanted, I didn't want to be the guy that was 40, 40, you know what I'm saying? Like you yeah. see that everybody was like, that, no, I wanted to be here at 22, 23, yeah. you know? So that's where I've, I've really gotten to a point of just, just enjoy every moment. And, and I had to come to a realization too, and this was a little over a year ago. I had to ask myself, what if it doesn't happen? What if it, what you really, what if it never happens for you and you stay right where you're at? Are you okay with that? And I was like, you know what? I am. I, I'm absolutely fine. 
I mean, of course you have those goals. As long as you can continue to try, right? Because you want to be told like you can never develop anything from here, right? Because I think that for me, as long as I can still have the freedom to do it, and if I fail, that's okay. Yeah. But I would be, and I'd be okay with the results as long as I get to try, I think. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that sounds a little bit deterministic, but I don't know. Anyway, I think in a in a way, it's it slowed me down. Where before I was like in this rush, and I, I looked at this too. So I was, I mean, you talk to anybody, go go go, Stanley. What are you doing now? Again, all yeah. great stuff. And every single risk that I've taken in my life, every single one has been about benefiting other people. Every company I've developed has been about shaping, benefiting, providing something to other people to move them forward. Yep where I was struggling. And so that made me feel good. It's like, okay, I've, I risked it all for other people. Um, but also when I look at my kids, you know, again, my you know, oldest going on 11, youngest is seven. And I was like, okay, so I've had these little hangups and it hasn't quote unquote happened for me yet. I think it's time to switch gears a little bit to move slower for myself, build quality. So, you know, as you talk about people in their forties and fifties, like, you know, I don't need to rush anymore. So I can make smart decisions built with quality and maybe it's something that materializes in five years, 10 years. But I look back and it's like, that's going to be a great thing for my kids now. I mm-hmm. don't want them and they're, they're creatives too. Mm-hmm. I don't want them to have to struggle and not have the support like I went through. So I've, I've, I've switched gears. Uh, okay. So I'm going to just ask this question. This is something I really, I'm really curious your perspective on. And I think about this a lot. But man, maybe the morning podcast is not good for my vocal cords. So you're doing great, by the way. With I'm glad you're talking and I'm me. <clears throat> but um, so, and maybe it's a little bit different because I grew up, and I don't no disrespect to my parents. I, and I I try to say this carefully. I grew up pretty poor, so I didn't. We didn't have my parents divorced when I was like five, and so in my dad's situation, we had very little money. My mom's still pretty poor, but not quite as, not quite as poverty level or whatever you want to say. And, um, growing up, what I have for my kids is a hundred percent different than what I had. And when you say like your kids are creative and you want to support them, do you, do you mean also entrepreneurial? Definitely. Were we in that meeting together? We were in that meeting when the the city was talking about developing that thing. We can't say on camera. Yes. Right. And I don't know how I came off, but I just was trying to say like, look, being an entrepreneur is not necessarily a gift. You can just hand somebody and expect them to run with it. They have to kind of figure it out. And if I think there's a line you can cross, I don't know what the line is, but if you give someone too much support, then I don't think they're an entrepreneur anymore. You've just kind of created a little job for them that you're overseeing. Um, When you say you want to support your kids, do you ever wonder about how to keep them hungry? No. So, so I think that's the thing that you can't, you can't teach the hunger. Yeah. So when I look at my, especially my, my youngest, my seven year old, every day he's making something, he's already written books. And so, <laughs> and I awesome. look at, you know, at night, my parents, I had, you know, great parents. Again, I didn't grow up, you know, wealthy at all. I mean, I had everything I, I needed. Um, and they didn't know what to do with me as a creative child. They, you know, most parents didn't know what to do. Yeah. Um, and I always had to find it from someplace else. But I, I look at my youngest man. He's like writing books and creating stuff. They've are there, and they talk about entrepreneurship because they see their dad as you know, yep. entrepreneur, uh, videographer. Dad, you've done this, and this is one of my ideas. You know, my shirt, my apparel company. So you know, I've done a lot of different things, and so I'm like, okay, this summer cannot go by without me actually publishing my son's book. He's already done it. He just got an award from school. He's, he's written a whole series, like eight books. He was, he just yesterday. <laughs> Dad, I think I should make this a chapter book. Um, so where like, you know, some parents might look at that. It's like, oh, that's cute. That's cool. Like, no, this, he needs to have a book on Amazon that we publish and we're going to do it. I know an illustrator, make it happen. Um, before and financially and, and stuff, I could be selfish and look at my own business. Like, okay, I need to have my stuff set up first be, before I go try to help my kids. And this is what I'm, I don't say afraid of, but what I think about a lot is like, you've said that for the past 10, 15 years you've been grinding and it hasn't happened to where you want. Stanley, stop. Help them now. Do what you need to do for your family now and don't worry about tomorrow for yourself. Does that make sense? 
I'm not talking because I want to take that clip and put it on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> no, so it's all, yeah, absolutely. And, and I don't want people to feel like I'm not ambitious or have these, um, you know, goals in mind or things like that. It's just I'm I'm being more realistic about what has happened in the past. Obviously, the pattern that I've had. And again, I've done some great high profile stuff. I know a lot of amazing people, but I still it it didn't happen the way that I want it. So it's like stop stop creating this this world. Just live life, enjoy life, and let's let's see what happens. That's killer, man. I have more questions. I feel like we could be done, but that's I want to ask more questions. Yeah, I'll throw them at me. Um, so you got a show on DIY. How'd that happen? I, after hearing your story, I don't have any question how it happened. Really, I can imagine how it happened, but talk me through it. Yeah. So, so again, I am still I'm driven by this whole I me. That's what I named my production company I Media. I got I you know play on. Um, and so Jeremy, you know, we had been talking for a while about, you know, me coming out filming him. Didn't know what we're going to create or what we're going to do. And it went on for a, like a good year just talking like, hey, okay, I, I need to come out to one of your sites and, and film you, you know, doing a house flip. A friend of mine who's out in LA, we went to high school together. Uh, she had an idea for actually a, a rehab show, a flip show. Um, and she asked me, you know, I had been in the film for a little while. This was 2016. Um, I'd love for you to... Um, film my concept for me. So she came out, you know, I volunteered my time and uh, it just didn't, didn't click. Um, and he, the guy was also in Kalamazoo, just personality. It just, it just wasn't flowing very Kalamazoo well. Based guy though? Yep. Another oh. Kalamazoo based, uh, um, house flipper. And it just wasn't clicking. And I had no, I was just the film guy. I was just there to help capture content for her. Had, you know, no plans for, uh, you know, doing the show myself. And it was like two months after that, just kind of seeing, you know, for her eyes as a producer, what she was looking for. I'm like, okay, I think I, I can do this. Called Jeremy and had no intentions for a TV show. Uh, just started filming him. And from about the sixth episode, you know, my skills are developing a, a little bit more uh, where I had looked at an HGTV episode. Didn't even have cable anymore. I used to love HGTV, but you know, it'd been a while. And I watched the show. I was like, okay, I can flip it up. I can edit to this style. Let's give it a shot. And I did that and then, you know, posted it on, on YouTube and I was one of those people I hated being tagged. Like, don't tag I don't wanna be tagging your stuff. I don't <laughs> I don't wanna see anything. And then I became that guy because I was like, Man, this is this is great. You know, not from the editing, but I was like, this flows people need to see Jeremy. And that's what inspired me to connect with him in the first place. Cause he was posting pictures, he would do a Facebook live every once in a while. I was like, But Jer- Jeremy, people really need to see what you're doing. You're 32, 31 years old at the time. Um, you're cash free. You've got 16 properties. Um, you're kicking butt and people need to see you as a millennial and, you know, young African-American male. Like you're, you're doing some really great things here in the city. Started filming him. I tagged a whole bunch of people and I had connected back in my money smart kids days, you know, producing my show for, for young people. Um, there was a producer, Gary Bredow, uh, out of Detroit who had a show or has a show called Startup. And startup is about interviewing entrepreneurs. So he travels all around the country interviewing entrepreneurs. And he was just somebody, I, I saw his show. I was like, oh, this, he'd be an interesting person to connect with. I've been connected for about four years, never reached out in, uh, beyond that. So I was just tagging indiscriminately you know, for this YouTube that I just posted on my Facebook. And I think it was a day later, I get a message from Gary. Hey, Stanley, this looks amazing. We'd love to talk to you and Jeremy about a development deal for HGTV. And that same week, we were in Detroit having a conversation. What'd you do? How did you feel? I was excited. It was, it was cool. But so again, it was, it was at the place like, okay, this is cool. This was last February, 2017. Okay. That's, that's cool. Yeah. Something, and I will, I will revisit, back, revisit that, but something's happened to me that I do kind of want to regain. I think because I've done some really cool and amazing things and stuff hasn't gone to where I want it. Like even something that's amazing for someone else to hear is kind of like, oh, okay, we'll we'll see. You know, it's, you get it, cynical about this probably won't work out. Don't get too excited. It, yeah, yeah. Like, and I feel I like, like I, I'm kind of like jaded now. Where everyone like, asks me when I we started that the coffee shop, again. yeah, they go, "How are you feeling about the coffee shop? Are you excited?" And I'm like, "I don't get excited. <laughs> I'm I'm fulfilled. All right. All right. I'm content. That, that's about the extent I get. And I don't know. Everyone hates that about me, but I." I get excited internally if you see me at a live show, but I don't express it visually, uh, physically at all. I'm just like, I might lift my eyebrows a little bit. No, mm-hmm. I'm joking. I don't, know. I don't uh, know. You're probably not quite. I'm, I just, you know, calm, cool. Like, okay, we'll, we'll see what's up. So we, you know, we went up there 
And, uh, you know, they explained the process to us. So um, I had to put together, while we were there, I put together like a, a video to send to the network. So I produced that, gave it back to them. And then it wasn't until, that was February. It wasn't until April that we found out um, that they were interested uh, in the show. And uh, so we started filming in August for a pilot. So um, I know that our, our sizzle went in front of um, the executives, in which they saw about 40 other sizzles. And they only picked two concepts to potentially run with. Nice. Here Amen. we are. That's impressive. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it aired on DIY. Is mm-hmm. HGTV and DIY like sister networks? Yep. So Scripps Networks um, owns uh, DIY, uh, HGTV, Food Network, and Travel. And oh, okay. I think there's one more in there. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a pretty big deal. So now that you've kind of stepped into that world, are you now thinking like, oh, yeah. I want to produce other shows? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> And that's right. where, like, right. I've had so many things on the shelf um, over the years. So now, like, I'm, I'm slowly pulling concepts off. It's like, okay, I, you let me in this world. I know how this thing works. Let's, let's go. Yep. Nice. So, so yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting time. So, man, okay, so you've done such a nice job unpacking your story. Most of my questions are irrelevant at this point. Um, I guess one thing I still am kind of curious about, and, like, a lot of people – I'm very motivated. I don't have an I M E E like you do. And I, I really, I want to, I want to figure that out. Cause that's great. Um, but for me, like I'm, I'm very motivated to help people, um, that are younger figure out their life. I, I, I hesitate to say the phrase calling, but their life's calling, um, and how they can be the most impactful. And I've kind of gotten into this cadence when I go speak somewhere, if I go speak to a class at Western or something, cause I graduated from Western. So they'll ask me to come and talk to a class. And, um, but I've kind of just said like, you need to spend some time self-reflecting what it is that you love to do, right? There's the passion element. And then you need to think about, you need to be real with yourself and, and analyze if you're actually good at that thing and you can be good at that because sometimes what you're passionate about and what you're good at are not aligned. Um, and then, and if, if, if they are aligned, then go and figure out how to help as many people as possible and, and with as most impact as possible with that talent Mm -hmm. and that's how you're going to find at least vocational success and potentially happiness. I'm, I don't say happiness because I believe that happiness is a fleeting thing. we we chase around. Um, not going to get into that whole, uh, sidetrack, but for me, um, trying to help people find what it is that they can do and help each other. Cause a lot of kids when they're in college, I think you're just focused kind of like what you're saying. Well, maybe not quite what you're saying, but, when you're young, it's all about like, how can I get a really good job and make really good money? I mean, I, I, that's what I was like. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of people just, you assume that that's the currency in which you need to think. And so for me, I go, money will follow if you pursue quality work and help a lot of people. I, be, I do believe that. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I guess what I'm trying to think through is a lens of like somebody who's watching you. I think you got an awesome story. You've, you've done so much cool stuff. I appreciate the, the candor and like just transparency. That's probably my favorite quality about anyone is if they can just be real. Um, but is there, I'm trying to think through, is there a way that someone watching this who doesn't know what they want to get into could, I guess if you could speak to them specifically and just say, what do you, what do you want to say to someone who is trying to change their life? Maybe they they have a job they hate. Um, what words of advice do you have for that? Or that person. Uh, I mean, I think the biggest and it's kind of cliche is stop talking about it and just try. Don't don't be afraid to fail. Um, like like film. I mean, this was it's still new territory for me. I, you know, I didn't pick up a camera until uh, late 2012. <laughs> and it, I feel bad. You know, you guys own a production company. You guys are, are amazing. If you had seen me those first days, you would have laughed. Like, okay, dude, this is not <laughs> this is not for you. Yeah. And so I was put in a place of. If I would have talked to you, yeah. I'd have believed in you. Yeah, but maybe if I just saw your stuff, I no, would. You, you wouldn't. Uh, okay. No, I, I was. Yeah, it was terrible. Um, but no, I, I, I think just you, you have to experience. You have to put yourself out there and, and experience it some form or fashion, um, and know like this is what I want to do, or this isn't what I want to do. You know, there's a lot of people that talk about it, um, and that's where you know I wanted to create that experience in a way through film for young people to see it. Mm-hmm. So you say you want to be an engineer. That's great. Probably like 30 different areas that you can go into as an engineer. 
Um, and so you, you've got to have that, that diligence to go out there and investigate for yourself. Because, and I think the sad thing is that there's young people that go to school thinking they want to be something, get into this career, and it's like, oh, well, I really don't want to do this, but this is where my money's coming from. And they just stay in a successful job for the rest of their life. And that's like the saddest thing to me. So it's, it's tough. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard because, you know, you try to figure out what is it that button that is going to inspire someone or motivate them or empower them or educate them. It is different for everyone. And so, and it kind of goes back to my philosophy is like, just enjoying life. You have to look at every single moment and just enjoy where you're at right now. Um, and look at those opportunities that, that come your way and then also be willing to investigate something else. That's I know good. that wasn't, I feel like, no. I don't know, that wasn't enough. No, it, it's, it's, it's uncanny. Tough. It's uncanny how much this answer is consistent among people who have made the jump or have figured it out, so to speak. Maybe you don't think you've made it. Other people might think you have. You know right. what I'm saying? But people that are in it know that you've never made it. If you think you've made it, you've, you've not made it, clearly. I, I think because where I'm trying to come from for that answer is yeah. not trying to break down my own journey, but yeah. trying to provide a blanket for, for everyone. And I, I think this is it's challenging to do. Yeah, it's absolutely challenging. But to me, one of the things that I like about this opportunity, and, and this is kind of one of the reasons why I created or why I named our coffee shop Civil House, um, not to throw some random civil house. Oh, actually, I'm curious too. Well, for me, it was like, um, I, as much as we deal in the currency of like emotion and making content that makes people feel something and, and, um, where it ends up usually is social media. I actually think social media is a terrible thing for conversation. I, I just, I'm, I've gotten so distraught with it. And I think a lot of people have shared that same sentiment that you just, you hate seeing how people interact on there and you hate, um, I shouldn't say hate, but I, it's very discouraging to see how people have like fallen to this really low common denominator of communication, even to the point where we just send gifts. Mm. I'm, I love gifts in, in a funny sense. They're great. But to see someone get torn down on social media is always pretty heart wrenching for me. Even if I completely agree with, or, or disagree with the thing they said and the reason why they're getting torn down or whatever. But I, I, I just think it's a bad platform because I think most of the conversations we're having these days require some time and like human beings need to sit across from each other and read each other's nonverbals and like have empathy for each other. But that's literally not possible in social media. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, and the, and the brevity of it all. Um, so for me, I, wanted the coffee house to have kind of this physical relationship thing about it where you can go and have a conversation and, and talk at length about things, you know, because I think you use social media in a really positive way. And I really like that. And I try to do the same. I kind of made it a, a mission of mine to figure out how I can use Facebook in a really good way and like use it as an encouraging tool for people. It, Cause if you are going to say short things, might as well make them positive. Right. And they, they kind of have to be lofty. And I try to use it as a connector. So I've started to do this thing where I'll say, Hey, I know of a company looking for a job. Does anyone want to send me the resumes or just if I can do something good with it. Um, but the whole civil house idea, like I said, it goes back to the, the face-to-face -face interaction. If there's more places to have positive face-to-face -face interactions where you can discuss something that isn't, that just takes a little more time to unpack. Um, then, then, then I'm going to do more of that, I guess, and contribute more of that to the world. So um, my goal is to actually um, to open up this side for entrepreneurship series, have people come in and speak. Definitely love to have you in that um, as well. <clears throat> and uh, maybe have some live music and stuff, but just, just things more physical, real life things. I have a, I have a documentary I've been wanting to do for a few years, but I haven't been able to figure out exactly what the, I'm not sure exactly how it would come out. And like, if I'm trying to make a point, so when you make a documentary, a lot of times you're trying to drive at a point, underlying point that you want to then convince people of. Usually, um, there's plenty of documentaries that just film things and whatever happens, happens at Cinema Verite style, but, um, or Verite, Cinema Verite, I forget what it's called. But anyway, it's basically when you show up and just start filming and then let the story develop. But um, <clears throat> for me, I have this idea that, I think it's pretty tragic how small town America has completely been demolished. And I don't think 
people understand it. And I think it's very multivaried and like why it's happening. And and so my hometown, you know, back in 30 years ago was actually kind of a, a thriving little town and you could have a little town. And now we're just so used to driving through small towns and having mm-hmm. them look like three bars and a park and a school system. And there's nothing else there. Yeah. And I just think that's sad because when small communities or communities all were started, it was because we needed to be in a physical location close to each other to, to have the benefits of community and because of the internet, which is a good thing in a lot of ways, but I don't need a doctor locally. I can get on WebMD, and I don't need a church nearby. I can watch a sermon on TV or I can watch whatever I want on YouTube. Um, I can get everything shipped to me on Amazon and I, and so on and so on. And I can have community on online. So like it's, that's just one part of it though, Yeah, you know? So I'm really motivated by I'm emotional about the subject because I think it's good when people are around each other and it makes me sad when I see people who don't go outside and enjoy life and connect with other human beings. Cause I think, I think that's a, that's a reason why you see less, less empathy and less understanding of, of a nuanced opinion. We've become very binary in how we think you're either with us or against us all, on all these different things. Um, you're either, you know, you either for this issue or against this issue. I was like, man, it's just not, it's not that, it's not that simple half mm-hmm. the time, most of the time, but some things are, some things are a simple, you know, binary decision, but we live in a pretty complicated world. And I think the opportunity to sit down in front of somebody is really important. And I'm just saying, I'm trying to be willing to, to do that and create a place where it can be done. So that's a really long winded answer. I don't even know what we were talking about. No, but that was good. <clears throat> kind of the idea. And I really like coffee. So we started the coffee shop. So, um, and I, I, I like that too. Um, cause there's, we are, there's so many different facets to each of us. And the reason why I fell in love with entrepreneurship is because it, there's opportunities for people to experience a part of me and that can always change. Like I, I wrote a book, you know, that's a part of me. It's never been about business or, I mean, making money is important, but as you can see, it's a byproduct. It, it's it's always, things. you, you've gotten a chance through my music, through one of my videos, through my book, through being even a financial advisor, you've been able to experience a part of who I am in that particular season. And I think that's one of the most amazing, amazing things. I mean, I, I truly love the ability to create. I, I love that. And, and, you know, like I talked about, you know, you know before in this space, a uh, uh, barber spa, like it sounds cool, but I was like, I want to create an atmosphere, a place where people can hang out, whether you're getting your haircut or not. I mean, it's a great service, but at the same time, it's just a great environment to be in. Um, there's another project that I'm working on and, I want to give you details, but also be a little vague, but sure. I, I feel um, it, it's a big idea. Um, it's something I think will shake up the world, um, but it, it goes back to young people. And so and then I, this really has a, a big place in my heart because even when I was that 16 year old kid and working on my board game and I had the teacher helping me, but man, if, I, if I had really a, a group of people that could just help move me forward, in many ways, I felt like I was alone as an entrepreneur. Yep. Um, you know, reaching out for not only inspiration, but someone to help kind of, that has been there before. And I, I didn't have that. You know, I look for it, but I, I didn't really have that. Um, you know, I want to create something that um, is going to shake people up and really support young people as they pursue entrepreneurship. Um, and, and understanding how TV, or it's a TV concept, and understanding how that works is like, you've got to have the little entertainment piece in there, but I want it to be one of the most realist. Um, engaging type of uh, experiences for people to not just watch and be entertained, yeah. but it moves you to get you off your butt and to move forward. Um, so, so that's that's my next big thing that I'm working on. But I'm I'm not rushing. You know, it's something before you know three year old me, five year old, you know, ten years ago it was oh, I got to do this thing tomorrow. And so that's where now I'm being a little bit more patient and take my time to. Um, build quality. I look at, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, there's a show on Netflix, um, Flint. And I heard about it. I the documentary it series. It is, a, it is amazing. Yeah. I've heard and, really good things. You know, I've been watching the series and it looks great and I look back to, you know, I was doing ride-alongs with KDPS yeah. and, and film. I was like, this is what I should have made. Like, I was filming and then trying to put out something two weeks later. It's like, it takes time to really put something amazing together and 
And so, so that's one of the biggest lessons that I've learned as an entrepreneur is don't rush the process. Take your time with it and um, you know, reach out. You want to throw everything at your disposal. So all the resources that you have at your disposal to make it even more amazing, reach out to them you know, and, and, and put it together that way. I think this is a kind of a question that you may have unpacked throughout this process, but <clears throat> I think Gary V wants to buy the Jets. What's your, do you have a, like a ultimate goal that you're kind of running at? Um, I do. I do. It's, uh, it's actually related to that concept where I talked about young people, the, the TV show, but there's a lot of different layers to that. Um, I have uh, something that I'm, I'm not even working on it now because I just, it's just one of those things I can't do now. Mm-hmm. Um, but my ultimate goal is to create a, a platform for kids all around the world, making their entry into entrepreneurship very easy. Um, and not easy to take away you know, from them experiencing the, the tough times. Help and, them understand it. Um, no, moving beyond that, like to do it. I want to create something where kids can learn about entrepreneurship, financial literacy, careers, and every other element related to what they're going to need in their life, but through an online platform. So and it, almost a, a global, I don't know, school is not even the right word for it. When you say global, I just ask you this question, because I think global is an, an, that's a noble pursuit, but do you think that, because when I, when I think about global, there's a lot of differences in like, world cultural like what cultural values of one part of the globe versus another and you're obviously a product of western society so have you thought through like if it would be suited for someone that's like completely not westernized or you know or whatever yes and and where's why i say that is the thing that would tie all of it together entrepreneurship is the common denominator so i see entrepreneurship being the thing that blends it all together Mm -hmm. but of course there's other facets to fit your your culture that's cool your community um that, that's it i was very vague about that because sure, i don't sure. want to share i'll share more probably yeah. off air um we'll but it's, it's a big <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a big vision that's cool so it's it's still there um but i'm not rushing to make it might be 10 years from now might be 15 um but yeah a couple of practical level questions um do you ever wake up not motivated like do you ever so for me just real quick backstory uh, entrepreneurship journey early on, I would go through these cycles of, of excitement and then crashing really hard. Mm-hmm. And it was like about two week cycles at first where I was really good for two weeks. And then I have a day where I'm just like depressed and like super, I don't want to get out of bed because I poured out so much of myself and I needed, it was like my body telling me like, you've been going too hard and you need to stop. And I didn't realize it. And it would just, it felt like a depression cycle almost. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. Yes. All the time. I used to have those until yeah. I had that epiphany of, of, Hey, take it one day at a time. Yeah. You can still work on your stuff. Take it one day at a time. Now I have those days where I don't feel like doing any work, yeah. but yeah, I used to have those depression cycles and my wife, like she didn't know what was, I wouldn't want to talk. And you know, yeah. she definitely loves communication. Like, tell me you don't want to talk. Like, well, I don't want to talk. So it's hard to tell you. I don't want to, <laughs> but it, they would last for, I mean, I'll have like one every other month and it'll last like two, three days. Mm-hmm. And then it was crazy because when I'm out of it, I'm out of it. Like I'm good again. Like, hold up. What, what was going on with you? I'm like, I don't know. I can't even explain it. It's just, I think yeah. I just needed to have this. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to answer my phone. I don't want to text. And then I'm positive, Stanley, and ready to go again and change the world. Yeah. So I, I think that's, you need to embrace it. Um, I wish I had realized what it was early in my life. Yep. Um, but I think it's just a part of the cycle of, of being an entrepreneur and, and knowing that, I mean, cause entrepreneurship, you're, you're creating something, you're doing something for, for other people, whether it's your staff, uh, your community, you know, global, it's, it, there's so much just coming out of you that I don't think people even realize. Yeah. It's important to me that like, so I don't have any desire to leave Kalamazoo. Uh, I pretty much learned that early on. I'm not going to move to New York. I'm not going to move to LA. I'm a Midwestern person. Uh, my family's here. So it just, it didn't make sense for me to ever move. So I have a really strong interest in wanting Kalamazoo to be as good of a place as it can be for fun stuff to do good quality people here, creating cool stuff. And so I think that's why when I see what you're doing, I get really excited and I go, 
how come you're not leaving? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, why are you still in Kalamazoo? I mean, I, well, I, I tried to leave. I tried to okay. leave several years ago. Um, you know, got married. My wife's from Cleveland. Uh, we met in college, uh, okay. but didn't start dating until several years after that. Um, but you know, married at 22, and it, this has been this has been home. Um, and I want to see Kalamazoo prosperous. I want to see amazing things here. But I feel like I'm entering into a world now where, um, with you know, with media and TV, and I want to produce movies along with other things. Like I want to have physical businesses too. Yep. Um, but that world, I think, is going to pull me from Kalamazoo, but position me to do even greater things for the city. Yep. So it's, it's like I'm excited to leave to bring some things back and, yeah. and be better equipped to uh, help transform the city. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I'm excited. It's, it's a great, it's an exciting time right now. There's a lot of cool things going on and, and connections that I'm making. Uh, you know, Greg Jennings being one from here. Yeah. What are you doing with Greg? I saw you post about that. Yeah. So, so Greg, uh, you know, we've gone, I've done videos uh, for his family for a few years and uh, he had a TV show idea, uh, which can't share what the sure. concept is, but He's like, hey, man, you know, I, I see what you're doing with DIY, with Jeremy, um, the work you've done for me before. I have a TV idea. And, and so I flew out to L.A. And, and New York with him to kind of capture his concept. Um, and so we we just sent that off. I finished a few weeks ago and uh, we've got a couple television networks interested in his show, which I'll be the executive producer for. You now it's his show, but I'll be the EP. Yeah. And so That's I'm killer, man. kind of like. Just waiting, and and you know, before I was like, oh man, that's that's big, that's huge. We might not move forward with that for another year, or yep. or you just you just never know. So, yep. um, yeah, I'm just taking my time. It's it's great, but just taking it one day at a time, nice. enjoying life. I I thought what I was gonna say is that when you were doing the thing for KDPS, I think I understood what you were going for, and I was like, but I I probably wouldn't have said it this way, but hearing what you said in retrospect, it makes a lot of sense where you're like, you were maybe trying to do more of like a daily V like get it out quick when that's not what it was. It was more about telling a story about them. The daily V is about Gary and document, not creator, whatever. So if it was about you, maybe then it'd be beneficial to your personal brand to do it quickly and just put it out there. But with doing a story about, a subject and, a, and a, an arc you're kind of trying to follow or a real thing you're trying to tell the quality and getting in the right platform is going to have to take a little bit more time. That's where Gary V kind of doesn't know what he's talking about in some ways. And he knows I'm not at all dissing on him, but sometimes I'm like, yeah, Gary, YouTube's great, but if it, there are still some gatekeepers in play and they do need to, and for you to be taken seriously, you have to hit a certain yeah. level of expectation. I, I think for him, like, he serves his purpose in, in this space. Yeah. You know, there's people that can pull from, like, you know, you and I, I don't think you and I, we need a Gary V. Like, yeah. he's great. I acknowledge what you're doing and, you know, helping, you know, tens of thousands of people. But I don't think we've ever needed a Gary V in our lives because we've had our own motivation and you yeah. know, personal. Um, well, when I'm a little down, that, I might get fired up watching a couple of videos. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway. But yes, yeah, so I, 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 I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited for you know wor the work that you guys are doing, and um, I mean, you invite me here to come spend some time with you, and um, yeah, I, I admire you guys' work and you know, getting to know you personally now is like, oh man, this dude is even more amazing than and and Juan and and your whole team. So uh, I'm excited. <laughs> um, hey, I was. Are we good? <laughs> Sorry. He just wrapped us up really nice. Are we? Are we good? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, um, Stanley. Super appreciate it. Um, we're going to redo this whole podcast with you as one of the co-hosts, I think, from now on. So um, that'll be awesome if if uh, that actually happens. But um, how can people learn a little bit more about you? Give us like kind of a few of the Instagram, Twitter, wherever wherever you're at. Social. If, if people are interested in learning a little bit more about me. Um, so right now, my, my handle on Instagram uh, and Facebook is at Stanley M. Steps. So S-T-A-N-L-E-Y-M. S T E P P E S. Um, I had recently deleted my Twitter, deleted LinkedIn. Um, I, I had planned to go off social completely. I was gone for about three months, and and I knew that when I come back, it's gonna not with the vengeance, but <laughs> it, it's gonna be more purposeful. Um, so I'm at this place now, and, and you know, I'm glad that you invited me on, on the show because I'm at this place of I want to share more of my story, um, not just. And I'm just a positive person, so I post a positive things, but I want to 
talk about those lows that I might have too, and just people see see all of me. Yeah, and understand the journey. I did the same thing. Um, I this is actually really annoying, and I'm not very good at it. But uh, yesterday, I I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna do Instagram story all day. I don't care if it's boring or not. And I think what ends up happening is I get busy, and then I at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, I should post something on Instagram story. And I'm like, I don't have anything to say. There's nothing going on. And so, but I found that through the natural progression of sharing throughout my day, there were things that I could share. Like it was something dumb, but I said, I really don't like writing proposals. And I think people yeah. maybe not know that about me, but it's an exhausting part of the process. And I don't like, even when there's an official proposal process, I really don't like that. So, um, I'm also not very financially, I'm not a financial, that's a, a weak area for me. I, we don't, Rhino has basic like Dave Ramsey level fundamental principles, mm -hmm. but I'm not financially savvy. I'm not also legally savvy. So like, I don't care to read legal documents. I hire people to help with that. And thank thankfully we're at a point where I can afford that. But starting off the business, it was really uh, a low, low area of competency for me. Um, but anyway, that's not the point of what I'm saying. Gosh, I'm so bad at running this podcast. Hey, no, you're good. Dude, so thank you're you so about much. sharing a story. Yeah, sharing a story, sharing an Instagram story, just trying something new, I guess. Um, because I I think I'm we're probably pretty similar in this, but just you get kind of fed up with how you've done it, or you maybe just want to try something different and and you go through phases of I'm not gonna be on social media at all. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, I'm gonna be on social media all the time. <laughs> so anyway, I'm 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 supposed to be wrapping the podcast up, but <laughs> I'm terrible at it. Anyway, dude, we'll just We'll just shake hands. Thank you. Thank you. All right. See you, brother.